My name is Alexis Drought. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm about to graduate from Chatham University with a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. The title of my presentation is Turning as Ecofeminist Methodology for Achieving Environmental Justice in Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Annie Dillard's 1974 book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, is a critical text for drawing attention to environmental justice and healthy human earth relations. Throughout the text, Dillard calls for a reset of the relationship between humanity and nature. In a generation when scientific evidence of climate change and environmental abuse, degradation, and exploitation are denied by public leaders, Dillard's words from nearly 50 years ago encourage readers to reconsider how they encounter and relate to their natural surroundings. One example of the distance between humanity and the world that Dillard touches on in Pilgrim is turning away from the Earth's main source of light, warmth, power, and energy, also known as the sun. The most ironic aspect of humans' relationship to the sun is that so often we turn away from it, Dillard writes, or hide our faces, staying inside to avoid the sun's bright light. Dillard pushes back on this tendency to turn away from the sun by turning toward her surroundings, benefiting from beholding the natural world. By turning to face the sun, as well as other aspects of the world that humans reject, Dillard proposes turning as an environmentally just act through her own practices and encounters with nature. In this presentation, I will analyze how Pilgrim provides turning as an alternative to ignoring, prompting readers to turn toward the world for themselves. In Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, one significant way Dillard moves her readers in the direction of turning toward nature is through her use of biblical scripture. Pilgrim is not necessarily a religious text, but she does most frequently quote from the Hebrew Bible. I argue that Dillard incorporates biblical references into her text as support for turning as an ecofeminist methodology. I will examine the significance of human relationships with nature, using Dillard's text to demonstrate how turning could acknowledge humanity's role in the world. While Pilgrim has been previously analyzed by ecofeminist and theologians, this analysis builds on the existing academic conversation to discuss how Dillard effectively combines religion with environmentalism in guiding readers to turn toward the natural world. My work approaches Dillard's writing through an ecofeminist lens and acknowledges what might happen in the process of turning toward nature and the ecological margins. First, I will discuss Dillard's reference to the Persian King Xerxes and the Sycamore, highlighting the significance of encountering beauty when turning to one's natural environment. Second, I will consider Dillard's use of Levitical sacrifice rituals and the witness of injustice and horror in nature. And lastly, I will analyze Dillard's mention of Moses seeing the back parts of God on Mount Sinai and the outcome of turning toward the world's astonishment and mystery. I will braid these three biblical passages together in a final attempt to suggest turning toward nature is irreversibly linked to choosing environmental justice. I aim to propose a reshaping and a reconstructing of human encounters with nature via spiritual perceptions of the beauty, the horror, and the mystery of the planet we call home. Before focusing directly on the text, I want to note how ecofeminism provides a framework to analyze Pilgrim through the intersection of natural exploration and religious references. In their introduction to ecofeminism, feminist intersections with other animals and the earth, Carol J. Adams and Lori Gruen express how the intersection of women immigrants, black people, indigenous people, and people of color, workers and animals 
is the heart of ecofeminism, drawing attention to compassionate relationships between humans, creatures, and the land. Ecofeminism draws scholars to approach the combination of nature and spirituality, drawing emphasis toward ecological margins and human earth relations. Dillard expresses ecofeminism in her own way by facing and observing her natural surroundings. I argue she acknowledges her relationship with the environment and her dependency on the world by turning to face nature and accepting what she might or might not encounter. Refusing to ignore the world, as Dillard suggests, can help us face our natural environment and acknowledge our role in its health and or degradation. Religion within the framework of ecofeminism is more convoluted, specifically concerning harmful patterns of climate change denial and land degradation by religious groups. Ecofeminists often approach religion with the lens that many patriarchal religions enforce the power of men over women and nature. Lynn White, the author of The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, writes that Judeo-Christian tradition is to blame for environmental degradation, particularly due to the distribution of the idea that humans are, quote, dominant over the land. Since the publication of White's article in 1967, many ecofeminists have come to agree that anthropocentrism and conquering mindsets in Western religions tend to justify the mistreatment of the earth rather than protecting God's creation. Because of a history of religious groups degrading and dominating nature, religious textual interpretation and analysis must be a part of the solution rather than the problem and help us reframe how we view the natural world. By turning to our environment and analyzing religious texts during the process of turning, we can practice ecofeminism by building a more positive relationship between religion, humanity, and the world, which would result in a healthier human earth relationship and better treatment of the earth by humans. Pilgrim at Tinker Creek is not an argument for nature on behalf of one certain religion, rather expressing how an exploration of the natural world has religious and spiritual significance. Dillard's raw and open mixture of religion provides a frame of reference for spiritual observation and religious interpretation while experiencing creation. My research demonstrates how Dillard's use of Old Testament biblical references in Pilgrim cushions the claim that turning toward nature will improve human relationships with the earth by revealing the environment's beauty, horror, and mystery. The first way Dillard tackles the quest of turning is by accepting the beauties she notices in the natural world. In Pilgrim, Dillard references Persian King Xerxes, a commander of battle in the 400s BCE, who halted his army to behold a simple sycamore tree. This experience affected Xerxes so deeply he had the tree's shape stamped onto a medal of gold to wear around his neck. Dillard draws out Xerxes as a historically religious figure and uses his insistence on seeing the sycamore as an example of turning toward the natural world and running into beauty. Xerxes stops his entire army to see the sycamore and then engraves the tree's outline on a metal to wear around his neck. And this is proof this king knew how to turn to his natural surroundings and appreciate nature's beauty. This section also highlights a couple other examples of beauty as a result of turning. The chapter where she refers to Xerxes begins with Dillard seeing a forest folding in on itself, watching the colors of the mountains change under setting sun and losing self-consciousness as she pets a puppy, claiming she was, quote, more alive than all the world, end quote, in these moments. When referring to her sight of natural things and observations of the seasons, 
Dillard echoes Thomas Merton by saying she needs more time to see all there is to see. In Facing Tinker Creek, Dillard expresses an overwhelming joy in encountering nature with her senses, feeling the mist on her cheeks, hearing the sound of moving water, seeing the light on the water surface. In this chapter, Dillard shows her readers the beauty they might find should they follow her example and turn toward nature. By demonstrating this beauty, she leads readers in the direction of facing nature and leaning into their own relationship with the environment. This chapter in Pilgrim is not the only one that raises the potential for encountering beauty while turning toward nature. Pilgrim's first chapter, entitled Heaven and Earth in Jest, precedes Dillard's reference to Xerxes with the proposal that beauty is always around us, but only when we stop to face the world do we notice it. In a chapter on the season of spring, Dillard says, beauty itself is the language to which we have no key, both informing the reader of the mystery of nature while also expressing an urgency for seeing beauty. We see this language in Dillard's use of Xerxes, where she doesn't cite his words to describe the sycamore, only his action of engraving the tree on a metal. Dillard takes the first step in following Xerxes' lead by turning as well, writing about her pursuit of her relationship with nature. Quote, I went out to see what I could, end quote. And yet we see in Pilgrim how beauty is not the only outcome of following Dillard's lead and turning toward nature. There is also the possibility of experiencing horror and injustice while facing the world. While she willingly embraces the beautiful side of nature, Dillard is not unfamiliar with its horrors as we can see in Pilgrim, where she often embraces the harsh realities of creaturely interactions. In Pilgrim, Dillard often refers to nature as being chancy or a risk, using these words to describe mother lacewings eating their young offspring, frogs being eaten by the inside out by giant water bugs, and the killing frosts that come every year. Dillard is bluntly forward when describing her witness of cruelty and creaturely violence alongside beauty and her own personal turning, refusing to hide nature's disturbing side. Nature, Dillard writes, is where, quote, the twin oceans of beauty and horror meet, end quote. And we see these twin oceans pop up together multiple times throughout the text. Dillard's reference to biblical history continues to defend the argument of turning toward nature, adding on to Xerxes' experience by referring to Levitical sacrifice rituals. In ancient Israel, one practice of giving thanks to God included a priest waving the breast of a slain, unblemished ram of consecration before the Lord. In addition to this, quote, wave breast of thanksgiving, end quote, as Dillard calls it. The priest also heaves the shoulder of that same ram in the direction of the Lord in an act of defiance and doubt. This biblical reference defends the proposal that in turning toward the world, one might find horrors and cruelties which were previously ignored or overlooked. Turning toward our natural environment as an eco-feminist practice may reveal the light and beauty of ecological systems on the margins, but it also might illuminate the violence and harsh realities of the world that we have been so long ignoring. The shoulder heave of the ram of consecration, Dillard says, is a violent, desperate way of catching God's eye. God, look at what you've done to this creature. Look at the sorrow, the cruelty, the long damned waste. Through the Levitical passage, this article proposes Pilgrim's embrace of horror is an equal part of its embrace of beauty. 
The chapters where Dillard uses the wave breast and the shoulder heave are speckled with other examples of horror and injustices found in nature. For instance, she writes of annual violent frosts, discussing how leaves die and fall off their trees, how birds are forced to move south to escape harsh winter, and how death threatens all life as it accompanies winter. Dillard loops back to seeing a green frog sucked to his skin by a giant water bug, an image she repeats throughout the text, writing about how death is always a part of the natural world. In his reading of Pilgrim, Cra Craig Albin speaks to Dillard's proposition of turning toward the world and how this action can provide truth, but also an equally troubling view of the universe. Diller doesn't hesitate to present horror as a possible outcome of turning. And through the use of Levitical law, she encourages readers to lean into the raw and violent side of nature. And though Dillard says cruelty is a mystery and the waste of pain, she still finds nature's darker sides worth turning toward. It is enough for Dillard that she has been touched and purified by her encounter, Margaret Beamer says. In addition to beauty and horror, one might also experience nature containing many mysteries when turning toward the world. While we have observed Dillard presenting both beauty and horror as outcomes of turning toward nature, Dillard also turns to embrace the world's mystery a third biblical passage she uses in Pilgrim follows the Israelites' exodus from their enslavement in Egypt, which she refers to in her chapter on stalking. Dillard brings up Moses' request to see the glory of God, and though in the biblical text God refuses to let Moses see his full glory, a compromise is offered. God allows Moses to stand on Mount Sinai, while his glory passes him. And God says, thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. While Moses is willing to turn toward the full glory of God, he is instead greeted by the mysterious back parts of God's glory and returns from Sinai with his skin shining from his encounter with God. Even though we may be willing and ready to turn toward nature, our skin still might shine with more questions. We might not see the full glory of the natural world, though, like Moses, we might see small parts. This passage depicting Moses' exposure to God's glory reveals mystery as a final result of turning toward nature. Dillard uses the story of Moses on Mount Sinai as a biblical example exemplifying turning toward nature, toward mystery in nature. Dillard confesses nature is touch and go, and we can never predict what we will see in our turning, just as we cannot predict the career of any one particle. In her seeking out of muskrats, for example, observing their behavior and travel patterns, Dillard, who admits to being a muskrat stalker, spending days at a time seeking out the animal, knows for certain there is no knowing. In her time spent stalking muskrats, she might see the sun shining on the animal's wet fur back, or she might see a muskrat chewing off his frozen solid tail in winter. Yet ultimately Dillard knows the animal is unpredictable as are all aspects of nature. When turning toward the world, this article argues, one might experience beauty and or horror, but even more likely, one will run into more questions. As Elaine Teachton writes in her article, Perceptions of Nature, all of life was worth noticing to Dillard because any piece of it could lead to revelation even if such a revelation inspired further wondering or inquiry, Dillard would still say the entire process was worthwhile, refusing to allow mystery to intimidate her. 
Yet Dillard refuses to be discouraged by the queries that pop up after experiencing nature, simply because when she turns toward the world, she knows she is alive. By following Dillard's lead on embracing beauty, horror, and mystery, we can learn to reshape our relationship with the earth by turning toward nature. Regardless of her shocking and surprising encounters, Dillard turns to face nature and all the earth can offer, including the beauty of trees, the horror of creature-on-creature -creature violence, and the mystery of it all combined together. Dillard calls for turning by her use of biblical passages, religious history, and our own encounter with the world. In Pilgrim, readers are left questioning Dillard's proposal to either turn away from and ignore or turn towards and embrace. While Dillard leaves room for questioning and doubt, she guarantees her readers one thing. Should they refuse to turn toward the earth, they will miss out on the beauties, horrors, and mysteries of the world forfeiting the opportunity to grow as a spiritual individual. Dillard herself confesses missing too many things, and yet she still chooses to turn to the world around her. She turns with a religious lens, admitting to her readers how spiritual awareness and environmental appreciation go hand in hand. Dillard identifies how human self-consciousness separates humanity from both the creator and fellow creatures. By following Dillard and asking ourselves to simply turn toward the world, we will be able to see the awe and the wonder of the earth. We will see the sycamore with fresh eyes, heave violence back toward the heavens, and see the mystery of nature. Will we turn to face the giant water bug, the praying mantis mothers, the muskrat floating on creeks? Will we accept new sight, accept the world as it is and treat the earth like a home instead of a dumping ground? As Dillard says, the least we can do is try to be there. In turning, we are trying to be there to welcome spiritual awakenings and the questions that might follow. In turning, we are learn leaning into our new perspective, aiming to reshape our relationship with planet Earth, leaning into our dependency upon her. We can no longer ignore her. One way or another, we will come to terms with our role in environmental degradation. And it's up to us to begin addressing how the earth sustains and provides for us. Though we have for a long time been poor guests on this planet, we can still embrace earth for her glory, awe, and wonder, taking small steps to reimagine how to care for her, while also knowing she cares for us. The time to turn is now. Thank you.